Welcome to the SEI podcast series, a production of Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The Software Engineering Institute is a federally funded research and development center operated by Carnegie Mellon University and sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. This podcast and the series are available on www.sei.cmu.edu forward slash podcasts. My name is Suzanne Miller, and I'm very pleased to welcome today Andrew Mellinger, one of my colleagues and friends. And today we're here to talk about moving target defense. And I'll let him talk a little bit about what's your background, what brought you to this work, and then we'll get into what is this all about. Sure. So uh, in general, um, I'm kind of a software engineer to the full spectrum. Uh, I really focus on software architecture, but also on uh, adaptive and dynamic systems. Uh, and so that's kind of an obvious fit for when we talk about moving target defenses, which we're kind of now talking about. Uh, we term them as dynamic network defense. Okay. Uh, so obviously that has led me into that area. Okay. Why is dynamic defense an important topic? So if you think about, when most people think about defense, whether it be a network or a physical entity, they think about kind of a, a static set of defenses. So uh, you know, we're used to thinking about how I defend an organization. Imagine a, a brick wall, a strong door, a gate, or something like that. And all those defenses, what they evoke is this kind of big monolithic static uh, set, of, uh, set of walls. Okay. Sure. Um, and within uh, n enterprise networks, what we find is that that gives a lot of opportunity to our attackers to understand what we do. Because so they while can see the wall. Absolutely, absolutely. It gives them time because we don't change it over time. Mm. And while that's a natural thing to want to do when building your defense and maintaining, and not just your fence, but your entire enterprise, uh, what we try to do is say, if we move those things around, how can we make it harder for the attacker to understand our environment? That's the fundamental okay. premise. It's as simple as that. All right. So how do you go about making a defense dynamic instead of static? Yeah, so in most cases, you actually can't take an existing defense and make it dynamic. What you end up having to do is redesign or re-envision your systems to have dynamic attributes. Okay. So imagine your computer, which has an IP address. Uh, what if that IP address was changing over time? So you weren't at the same address. You were somewhere else. So when, they did it, when the adversary did their initial uh, reconnaissance, they would find you at a particular address. And then when they went, com when they went to come back and compromise your machine, it could be somewhere else. That sounds like a productive way of, of foiling that kind of attack. Are there other specific kinds of attack that dynamic defense is particularly geared to defending against? Uh, actually, they cover all the spectrum. So anywhere from a host, any attribute of a host, whether it be memory layout, okay. uh, instruction layout, all the way up through networking stacks and protocols and network routes, all the way up into how we actually work with our computers. So uh, most organizations have a policy where you have to reset your password. We know that one well here. Uh, what if you had to do that on a weekly basis instead of monthly basis? <sighs> now, that changed that. As a user, I, I give you a heavy sigh because it's problematic from right. the user interface viewpoint of remembering all those things. So, but you have a solution for that, I'll bet. Well, actually, we don't yet. Oh, darn. That's a lot of the hard problems. <sighs> So but what you brought up was, as we change that password, as I force you to change that password to make the defense better, you know, if the adversary had been cracking it and now you have a different one, they have to start over. Um, how do I make it so that I can have a dynamic defense, but it doesn't cost the defender a lot of money? Right. So patterns that you have ways of manipulating in unpredictable ways is one of the strategies you might think about for something like that. Right, and also how do I make that information though? So how do you remember your password if it changed all the time? Yeah. How do you? I'm not telling on video. Right, we don't have a good solution <laughs> for that yet. Well imagine, imagine if you're a systems administrator and you have lots of password changing or network sure. layouts. And so we have to build a set of tools too that enable us to understand that dynamic environment. So is that, you've got a platform that you're working on yes. to actually help to validate and vet new technologies that are in this arena trying to help with these kinds of problems. Yes. So tell us about that. Yeah. So the platform, um, uh, we call it middleware because it's basically what it is. Uh, it deals with sending around messages and information between all the various machines that are involved in your enterprise. Mm -hmm. And its job is to kind of mediate between that dynamic change and the static environment. So it will help a machine move and be able to send back information and say, I'm still the same machine. Now, obviously, you're going to say as well, if you're doing that, couldn't the adversary tap into that? Well, I was going to say that. Right. You're probably imagining that. That's a common question we get. Mm -hmm. And so the answer is that's the obvious point of attack then. So attackers are going to come after us. 
because we control that environment instead of going mm. after a lot of other things. And so oh, we know that. And so we have to become, uh, we have to work especially hard at designing in security mm -hmm. and imagining what those scenarios are going to be like. But since we're starting from the beginning, we can build security in from the ground up. Okay. So build security in is one of our big um, themes in all of our security work at the yeah. SEI. And, and you mentioned the difficulty of moving from a static to a dynamic environment. Do you have any sense of you know, what's the proportion of organizations, enterprises that are moving to dynamic defense at this point, or is it really, is it just in that too hard of a, of a change kind of category? Uh, so we see, um, so what they call moving target defense before is moving target, trying to envision the idea of somebody running yeah, across the field, yeah. um, uh, is being implemented by a variety of companies out there, but typically they're point solutions. And so they might, uh, uh, change how a web page is laid out internally to make it harder for somebody to attack. Mm -hmm. uh, they might do things like change your password, change a network connection. What we don't see is people doing that systematically across the enterprise. I see. We don't see them taking one vendor's defense, another vendor's defense, and trying them together. Okay, which adds more complexity, which more complexity in the defense means takes more complexity to attack. Right. So some, at least some proportion of attackers are going to give up and say, forget it, you're too hard, I'll go to an easy one. We, we hope so. Yeah. Right, and certainly, even if they don't give up, that time that it takes them to penetrate allows our defenders to find them. Right, right, And right, so right, right. we don't have the assumption that we're going to stop the attacks because we're never going to stop all the attacks. Right? Yeah, it's, it's the beginning of the, of the school year, and the number of things I've been sending to our suspicious uh, email address is, like, skyrocketed. Even right. with all the filters we have, it's like, oh, they're back. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> And the more we can make that obvious to the defender, the faster they can get in there and, and, and make better decisions. Right? Okay. All right. Yeah. So what uh, kinds of things have you found in using this platform? What, what are some of your research results in terms of things that work, things that don't work, or may, you may not want to say what things don't work? Yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah, we're still very early, very early in that. And our research in particular is not so much in which defenses actually work together, but really on the complexities and the challenges of making them work together. Okay. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, one of the key challenges is um, when a defense is actually changing things, how do we watch that? And most people who are designed... How do you gain the insight in terms of what the attacker is doing? Actually, no. How do, we, how do we use that change so it doesn't confuse the defender? Ah, okay. Right. Okay. So if you're a system administrator and your machines are moving around, you've lost control. Sure. So how can you, how can you make them move around from the perspective of the attacker... But okay. not from the perspective of the defender. Okay. And right. most attack or I should say, most um, uh, vendors don't think about that. They they say we've got this black box solution. You stick it in line, and all's good to go. And then the, the forensics guy has to come in after the fact and say, well, this thing did this stuff, and I don't know what it did, and I can't really figure out how it slowed the attack or how the attacker got through okay. or anything else. And okay. so they're they're not that easy to use from the forensics perspective. Gotcha. So this is a team sport, it's obviously. Team. There's lots of people that have ideas about many of these aspects, mm -hmm. at w which attributes are more amenable mm -hmm. to becoming dynamic, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about the collaborators and the collaborations that you've used to make this happen. Yeah. So uh, uh, folks on campus in the Institute for Software Research, they've been looking at um, self-adaptive systems now for probably nigh on 15 years. Uh, and that uh, they, is part of an uh, effort called Autonomic Systems, mm -hmm. which came out of IBM back in the early 2000s. Uh, and they've been doing research into the, kind of the broad uh, ideas of self-adaptive systems. Uh, so ideas like how would I increase the performance as things, uh, so, so they call it self-optimization. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I repair the system, so self-healing. Um, how do I configure the system automatically so I don't need to do that self-configuration? Mm -hmm. And the fourth part of that is self-protection. And so okay. we've really been focusing our that sort of adaptive research community on the self-protection part. Okay. All right. That yeah. sounds exciting. And it's yeah. always good to work with ISR. They're, they're a wonderful, yeah. wonderful group of, of folks well, to work with. And they have, that, they have a huge amount of traction in that space. And so being able to say, okay, take those ideas you did for, for, for performance, mm -hmm. right? How do you talk about... You know, latency and bandwidth and adaptability and lead times and all these sort of things from a performance perspective. Right. Now adjust those for protection. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So it's not just we're cooking up something, you know. It's not pure invention. It's adaptation. It's self-adaptation. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. um, I did that on purpose, of course. Yeah.
Yeah. All right, so where are you now and where are you headed in the next year or so with this work? So our, we're, we're at the point now that we have our middleware platform working and we, we use this thing called uh, the MAPE K loop. That's the autonomic systems loop. It's kind of okay. a, um, uh, monitor, analyze, plan, execute. We have this loop. We've implemented a loop and we're, we're actually now building out the adapters that run some candidate systems. Okay. And so we brought these systems in while well, we're bringing them in and wiring them up. And we're starting to pit them against each other and see if we turn on both, what happens? Will they okay. work together or will they not? And if they won't work together, how do you build this uh, uh, self-adaptive systems loop to recognize that and be able to say, okay, well, under these conditions, I should be using that one. Okay. And okay. then 20 minutes later, under these conditions, I should be using that one. How can it Right. Change those over. And using them together is not productive in this case. So. And some of these, and some of them they are. Sure. Okay. And so how do you have these advanced enterprises be able to bring up more than just a handful, you know, complex uh, interactions across the entire, you know, think thousands, tens of yeah. thousands of machines. Yeah. Well, when you get that problem about the changing the password every week so that the <laughs> user can still remember it, when you get that one figured out, I want to, I want to play. Okay. Because <laughs> right. I really need that one. Um, Andrew, I want to thank you for sharing your work with us. Self-protection, we all need that. Um, it is kind of, there is this tension between user usability and protection, and this dynamic kind of idea adds a little more complexity in, but it, but it does give you more protection. I can see exactly where that's going, so we've got to find some of those yep. solutions, and I know you guys are working on that, so thank you. So um, I do want to say that uh, you were highlighted uh, your, your work was highlighted in the SEI's Year in Review for 2015. That's our annual publication that talks about work across the Institute. So that's one of the places that people can find your work. And a PDF of that publication is available at sei.cmu.edu forward slash year in review. That's year in review altogether. The SEI Year in Review highlights work from our past fiscal year and showcases the support that we provide the DOD and other organizations in acquiring, developing, and deploying trustworthy software-enabled capabilities. As always, we include links to these resources in our podcast transcripts. This podcast is available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu forward slash podcast. It's also available on the Carnegie Mellon University's iTunes U site. Thank you very much for viewing today.